Singapore, 1942. Amidst the ruins of the island in World War II, a group of senior officers discuss the fate of the beleaguered city deep inside Fort Canning Hill. They would determine the course of Singapore's history in a hill that has been instrumental in the defence of the island for centuries. Once, this was the seat of power, the resting place of pioneers and people of faith. It's a memory landmark of our childhood years and of our lives in modern times. The hill has seen all of the major events that shaped us into who we are today. From here, we can tell seven centuries of our story, our history from the hills. For centuries, the hill has served as one of the last bastions of defence for the island. From the era of ancient kingdoms to the dark days of World War II, these are stories of those desperate days. 14th century Singapore, a time when the ancient kingdom of Tamase thrived in this port city. The rulers of this kingdom built a palace on top of Fort Canning Hill, a point that overlooked the settlement near the mouth of the river. The palace was located in what is now the Fort Canning Service Reservoir. This high point was the perfect place to defend the city against any invaders. There was an ancient wall that ran around the foot of Fort Canning, or Bukit Larangan as it was known at the time which means Forbidden Hill in Malay. This was used to defend the palace from attack by land or sea. Singapore in the 14th century already had pretty strong defences. We know it had a wall. It was mentioned already in the Chinese sources, uh, and they mentioned the Siamese already attacked Singapore, or Tamasic as they were calling it, around 1330. Uh, but according to the Chinese source, the, the Singaporeans then shut up their gates and held off a siege for about a month. So they actually had a wall and had a, a gate <laughs> that they could then use to withstand an attack of over a month. They had water inside the wall. And then uh, eventually uh, the, the attackers withdrew. This was a tumultuous period in Singapore's early history. The ancient city of Tamase was attacked by rival kingdoms numerous times at the peak of its empire, from the 13th to the 14th century. It finally fell to the Siamese nearing the end of the 14th century. Several hundred years later, a new group of people arrived. The British realised the importance of the hill in the layout of the land and proceeded to build a fort on the hill in 1859. That hill was of obvious importance because the focal point of British activity was the mouth of the Singapore River, and that hill overlooked the mouth of the river. So there were defensive capabilities on that hill from the earliest part of the British period. Completed in 1861 by 400 coolies and named after Viscount Charles John Canning, Governor-General and First Viceroy of India, the fort boasted seven cannons pointed to the sea, and even more artillery positions added a few years later. There was a barracks, an arms store, and a hospital in the compounds of the fort. As a hard base of last defense or last resort or last refuge against any attack against Singapore, both from the outside but also from the inside. Fort Canning, however, was never used in the defense of the country. Fort Canning, when it was completed in the 1860s, was, the day it was built, the most pointless, useless fort in the British Empire. It was in the wrong place to protect the shipping in the harbor, which was in any case already beginning to move from the river out towards what would become Keppel Harbor. It was demolished in 1907. Tan Teng Teng, former curator of the Battle Box on Fort Canning, recounts the discovery of a sally port on Fort Canning, a secure entrance to the fort that was built here during the 1800s. So this is the sally port. 
uh, it's part of the 1860 uh, fort structure. And originally, when I was uh, you know, still working here in the early 90s, or well, mid 90s at that time, uh, this was not exposed yet. It was only uh, partially exposed, the, the top half of it. So let me just walk up there and show you what it was really like. So we had the slope, uh, we didn't have the vegetation like that, it was just normal grass. And up here, this part was exposed. As you can see, it was buried up to this level. So this is all the many years of being uh, buried and all that moisture that was going through. So this was all cemented and we had Bangladeshi workers here. And so I just borrowed them in their free time and said, you know, knock a hole in this wall and waited about two days. And uh, I thought that it looked fairly safe, poke our head in, no problem. Uh, so what we did after that was uh, to start digging. So it was also buried inside up to, I don't think we could see the steps at that time. What we did was we ran in and start digging down till all the steps appeared and then came to this, knock off the other half of the cement block here and then we start digging downwards. And up to some point, the workers are saying, okay, we're done. We've completed digging everything. And I said, no, 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 I think there's still some more steps because going by the gradient and the steps, it couldn't just stop here halfway. There had to be something there. I wanted to see what was leading down to the uh, road level and they continued to dig down and there the steps appeared. Deep beneath the hill and located just behind the main building at Fort Canning Centre, lies one of the last remaining evidences of the importance of this hill as a strategic military landmark. The battle box of Fort Canning Bunker was built in 1936 to serve the headquarters of the British Strategic Command as the nerve centre for British military operations in the Far East during World War II. The complex of underground rooms from which Point of Percival planned the war was left abandoned after World War II. And it was with the support of the Parks Board that Dr. Mix and I were able to open up the uh, bunkers and for the first time in many years, a decade, two decades or more, enter it to look at the potential for its redevelopment. The bunker had cipher rooms where messages were decoded, a signal control room, a gun operations room, and even had its own generator. It had its own telephone exchange and a complex ventilation system that recycled air. Tan Ting Ting was the former curator of the Battle Box when it first opened to the public during the 1990s. She has been researching and documenting the stories surrounding this hidden bunker. So this is the Battle Box. Uh, this is what we use as the regular entrance then when it was uh, still in operation. When you enter the Battle Box, there's actually a flight of steps going up and then down. This is to block off any possible flooding that could enter the battle box. If there was one bomb or any bombing that could, you know, actually um, damage the reservoir, this place could be drowned out by millions of tons of water. It was reopened in 1992 as the battle box, serving to recreate events that happened here for tourists and visiting members of the public. If we had left the bunkers as we found it, you know, cleaned out the more obvious piles of rubbish, then it would require a lot more explanations to the audience, the visitors coming through it. But if we had put in some restoration, the robotics, the restored furnishings, then yes, it would have certainly have helped the visitor to make more sense of what it was like. So it was a very difficult balance of how much to leave intact so the visitor would be aware that this is what we found, this is what the British left behind, and this is what we have reconstructed to put in place there. Show you the original situation of what it used to be like. The place was lined with abstus tiles 
supposed to what, ex absorb heat, absorb sound. There's a fair amount of graffiti left uh, on, on on the walls. Uh, took me three days to go through. Most infamous um, graffiti came from was found in the toilet, and this is the sketch of the Spitfire with a slit eye, buck tooth pilot, and. They've got people who scratch their names on it. O'Leary, uh, Royal Engineers, 1941. So Battle Box was probably completed as late as early 41. The fittings, the markings on the walls that the British had uh, abandoned, some of it was still intact there. So it was with a sense of excitement, hey, we can perhaps do something with what we see here. Plans to recreate the conditions and stories of the Battle Box were put in place during the early 1990s. I have to write a script. It's not just like a story. What, what do you see when you enter this place and that place? So there was this general scene of all the signalers working, the code breakers, and the people on the Morse code, there's a soldier manning the switchboard. And then, so all these are characters in there, they're people, you know, they could have been number one, number two, number three. But where we know who they are, they have a proper name. We had very few photos of the battle box and something very miraculous happened. So Arthur Lane, I mentioned that uh, prisoner of war, ex-prisoner of war, and he was doing his own research and uh, he mailed something to me and said, I'm done with my research, you can have all my materials. And he threw a whole chunk of photos at me. I looked at everything, I went through it, and um, two photographs stood out. And this is one of them, uh, simply because the thickness of the wall in this photo and the door was very similar to what would have been in the battle box because we had some doors remain. So, but it's really the thickness of the wall and the thickness of the wall is what made it bomb-proof. So this is another bomb-proof facility, you know. There was no caption, anything. And I thought, oh no, this is too much of a coincidence. And uh, I brought this photo and went through the rooms and the battle box. But I also instinctively, instinctively knew which room I was going to because there are two doors and there was only one room with a situation like that. Went right to the room and bingo, everything matched. The the wall is bare, the room is bare, but we have imprint of a hanger that was here before and the shelf that was here before, the, the, the marks were all there. So, you know, and then subsequently located the captions and it said that it was the uh, official photo for the uh, battle headquarters. So then we fit this back. This is Curtis, Brigadier Curtis, had an um, old cane furniture supply company make the armchair. I had the wicker baskets made by the inmates at the uh, Trafalgar home. Uh, that's the leprosy centre. So they made two of these for us. We made some of these and this is the one with the wax head in the battle box. We have something about between 25 to 28 um, figurines in there. So a lot of time and effort went into discussing um, which character was sitting where and you know what kind of posture they were adopting. So, and some time went on, and when McAndroids in the UK was comfortable enough, and of course, according to schedule, we went and, and inspect the figurines so that, you know, for them to achieve a uh, complete approval to have them shipped over to Singapore. This is what happened after we completed everything, placed everyone together. I had this shot taken really early. These are in their prime condition. So there is uh, Percival over here. Uh, that's Keith Simmons, that's Heath, that's Gordon Bennett, that's Cyril Wild. He died on um, a flight to a war crimes trial. It was here that Lieutenant General Percival and the Allied forces made the decision to surrender to the invading Japanese on 15th February 1942, subsequently changing the course of the island's history. On the morning of the 15th of February, 1942, that Sunday morning, when the chief engineer reported to General Percival that the distribution system for water had broken down and that water could no longer be circulated, and therefore it was gone. 
Singapore had to surrender. We were extremely fortunate to find among the Percival papers in the Imperial War Museum the notes of the last meeting he had in there of the, where the decision to surrender was taken on the morning of 14th or 15th of February 1942. And it was on the basis of that the series of minutes that we were able to reconstruct the diorama you now see of that meeting where the decision to surrender was taken. I read in some of the uh, research materials that they had the generator going in the background. So they don't want the conversation picked up by anybody outside that meeting. So when we recreated the room, we had to put in the uh, generator noise in the background. Fort Canning was part of a series of an interlocking defence strategy that served to protect Singapore against any invaders. And as time went on, it would also train many young Singaporean men and teach them the skills necessary to do this in modern times. As part of the overall defence strategy for Singapore, the British built other forts around the island, besides the one that was constructed on Fort Canning Hill. Fort Fullerton was built in 1829 to defend the settlement against any naval attacks. It was constructed on part of the ancient line of defence that ran through the area in 14th century Singapore, located around what is now known as the Fullerton Building. It was only meant to provide protection against small boats that were trying to sneak into the harbour and either uh, sabotage or steal shipping and other facilities. It wasn't a principal gun platform from which to keep a powerful enemy at bay. The little-known Fort Tanjong Katong, located between what is now Fort Road and Mayer Road, was part of a series of fortifications that defended the southern coast of Singapore in the late 1800s. Fort Road was named after the main point of entry to the base of Fort Tanjong Katong at the time. By the 1890s, 1900s, the eastward position was meant to be Katong, which of course was the first defensive position that would detect an enemy attack coming from the South China Sea. And the western defensive position was meant to be Labrador Park, which would perform the same function against any enemy coming from the Straits of Malacca then what you're looking at is a kind of a giant half circle stretching from Fort Road to Labrador Park with Keppel Harbour securely in the middle. And any point from which any attacker could sail towards Keppel Harbour, whether it's from the east from the South China Sea or from the south from, say, Batam and Bintan or from the west from Karimun and Straits of Malacca, as soon as they got within range, they would be shot at by at least two different positions firing at the one line of approach. That was the reason, that was another reason for the specific layout of the defenses and for making choices as to where to put what gun position. It was all part of an interlocking, mutually supporting network protecting the shipping in the harbour. As Singapore gained independence, the issue of defending the island became even more essential. A core group of senior Singapore Armed Forces officers was needed to train the next generation of troops who would defend the island. In 1970, the staff and command college that was built on the top of Fort Canning Hill by the British during the early 20th century was selected as the place to train senior officers on the finer points of military tactics and strategies. There's one important building up there, which many uh, younger Singaporeans may not be aware of. Well, that is what we call the uh, Singapore Command and Staff College. Uh, right now, uh, that building here is, a, is a hotel. But if you go back a little bit more in the 60s, the Staff and Command College, the very uh, beginning of the SAF, it all began inside there where today you have top generals, they all were graduates from the Staff and Command College. 
Retired Lieutenant Colonel Balasingham was one of the first few batches of senior officers selected to undergo training at the Singapore Command and Staff College. He was part of the group that was personally trained by Israeli military advisors during the 1970s. My time in Singapore Command and Staff College at Fort Canning was very demanding and physically and mentally because of, we, were, we were pushed very hard by our Israeli instructors. They expected us to be mentally alert and physically fresh in every situation. And our exercises lasted about five to six days from battle planning to execution of the battle. Because Singapore Command and Staff College has closed down. Then I saw some works to develop the tourist and spots and the restaurants on the, on the, on the other side of the slope. SESC cell was undergoing change to become a hotel. The external structure is the same. Even the, even the staircase is, is the same. But the interior has changed. We had, we had syndicate rooms, seminar rooms, battlefield training rooms. Today is all guest rooms. I remember as, a, as one of my training, we were required to uh, hang up some pictures, some maps. I took a hammer and knock a nail into the wall. The nail bent. So it was that tough. During my years in the National Service and the Reserve, I had to go up to Fort Canning to participate in various exercises. And those stints there reinforced my impression of the historicity of the place in our long cycle of history and also in a way made me probably aware that there was something under Port Canning, under the Command and Staff College in those uh, locked up doors to Percival's Underground Command Centre. This tiny hill has served the island for more than six centuries. It provided the people with a secure foothill on the thriving city a strategic point that they can defend themselves and their way of life with. And now Fort Canning Hill is ready for its next stage of life, as it forms a part of the collective memories of many Singaporeans for decades to come.